politics, like beauty, is often in the eye of the beholder. How you see the candidates and issues depends on who you are and what you wish for. So, what does a 34-year-old radical and co-creator of the Occupy movement, who is now running for mayor of a tiny town in Oregon, wish for this U.S. election year? Let's find out. Micah White is the author of The End of Protest, a new playbook for revolution, and we welcome him back to the agenda on Skype from Nahalem, Oregon. Mike, it's good to see you again. How are you doing? Excellent. How are you doing, Steve? Super. Thank you very much. I suspect you could give me a one-hour answer to this first question, but I'm going to beg you to do it in a minute instead. Uh, is America better off after eight years of Barack Obama? <laughs> um, I think we're basically where we were. You know, we're still trying to solve that basic problem of trying to give the people more power, and I don't think that we've given the people any more power after eight years of Barack Obama. So we're, we're still struggling to get out of that same pit we've been in for so long. If that's the pit you're trying to claw your way out of, which of the candidates uh, for next Tuesday's general election are you intending to vote for? Well, I'm voting for neither. Um, I think, sadly, you know, if you look at it, both Clinton and Trump agree on one thing, which is that if they are in power, they will make the decisions, which is the old way we've been doing power. And I think that Occupy Wall Street and these new breed of social movements are trying to teach us something else, which is the people need to be given power. We need to figure out how social movements can be making decisions. So I'm kind of holding out for that more beautiful uh, movement, more beautiful candidate. So I take it you're not voting libertarian or green either? No, because those candidates aren't even credible. They're not credible, and they still agree with the same thing which is Trump and Clinton agree with, which is representative democracy. They'll be the ones who make the decisions and this kind of thing. What, they, what we need is a kind of social movement that makes decisions like we're seeing it uh, develop out of Europe and these kind of places. Hmm. After the last presidential debate, you posted on social media, this presidential election is a missed opportunity for America. What is that missed opportunity you were referring to? Well, I think there was a beautiful moment after Occupy Wall Street and during Black Lives Matter when a lot of American activists were kind of looking abroad, seeing what was going on in Spain with Podemos, what just happened in, in Iceland with the Pirate Party. And, and they, they could have gone, we could have gone that direction. We could have launched a social movement that was going to win elections. Instead, we went and we backed Bernie Sanders, who ended up becoming the same old kind of lapdog for the establishment politics. So I think this election, basically, it gives, it's not giving voters anything different. It's the same old game. And I think we could have, I think we could have really, um, we could have had what they have in Europe right now, which is the exciting development of new political parties, which are inspiring voters, which are giving voters more power. And so I see it as a it's kind of tragic moment. Well, there is a movement out there that it certainly is inspiring voters. It's called Trumpism, which will certainly survive after Donald Trump is, is gone if he doesn't win the election next Tuesday. Uh, what do you think of that movement? You know, it's, it's a reaction. I think that, there, that, that his supporters are right, that there is something so fundamentally broken about American democracy that we do need a major uh, overhaul, a major, a major shakeup, right? But where they, but they're, they're making a fundamental mistake, which is that they're putting their hopes into, back into a single charismatic individual, which is, which is quite frankly what we learned in the 20th century as one of the biggest mistakes you can possibly do when you put your hopes into these authoritarian, single charismatic individuals. So again, it's, it, it, I throw it back onto them and say, what we need is someone like an anti-establishment candidate like Trump, but who agrees to submit to the will of a social movement, to open up town hall discussions and, and to make his decisions based on you know, community groups and all this kind of thing. That would be the kind of um, anti-establishment candidate that I could rally behind. I wonder, though, whether people might have drawn the wrong inference from a tweet that you recently put up saying, just imagine if Bernie hadn't capitulated and decided to be Clinton's lapdog, he could have swung into the lead today, but Byrne was no revolutionary, you tweeted. So it sounds to me like you're still looking for that revolutionary leader, unless I'm misinterpreting. I think what I'm trying to get at is that a lot of people critiqued the idea of putting out a social movement that could win elections by saying, well, it's impossible. And I think what I'm trying to say is that there are these surprises, these unexpected surprises. And look, we're experiencing one. You know, the FBI with their, with their sudden revelation of new emails found is one of those amazing surprises that's now making the election unpredictable again. So had there been a social movement in this position right now, then they could win. But obviously, because of the way our power is structured, that social movement has to have some sort of, I call them a delegate versus a representative, basically some individual whose name will stand for the movement. And if there was someone like that right now, we might see that person surge into, into election victory. Um, and I think that's, that's what I was trying to get at with that tweet, trying to make people understand that, we, that we, the history throws unexpected things and social movements could use them to their advantage. Sounds to me, though, like you have evolved in your thinking a little bit, because when you were on this program last March, 
you did sing the praises of things like Occupy, which was a leaderless movement, and now it sounds as if you're saying, uh, I, uh, you're, open to, you're open to a leader provided it is a leader who understands his or her limitations and, and understands the movement, correct? Well, I think that you, we're, we're faced with a kind of basic strategic and tactical problem, which is if a social movement wants to win elections and give power to the people, it needs some sort of individual to stand in for that election, which is why I'm basically running for mayor, right? So we need some sort of individuals who are willing to make a, a, a pledge to the people, which is that this is a movement about you, the vote, what I, the decisions I will make will be based on what you want rather than what I want and these kind of things. So I agree with you, it's more complex. I think that we need to, activists do need to figure out how to actually win elections rather than just romanticize and idealize and this kind of thing. So that's, that's what we're trying to struggle with is that someone's name has to be on the ballot, but how do we limit that person's power? How do we constrain their power to be a delegate of the movement versus a representative of the movement? Interesting. You are running, as you pointed out, for the mayor of the community in which you are in right now, Nahalem, Oregon. What's the population, incidentally? <laughs> oh, we're about 280. We have about 220 voters, so very small. Okay. Uh, certainly an opportunity to knock on every door then. How's the campaign going so far? It's good. It's good. It's, 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 what's amazing is that I think that Nehalem is a beautiful kind of microcosm that reflects the macrocosm of America. So we have the same income inequalities, the same basic problems. And what we suffer from in, in Nehalem is a kind of uh, lack of democracy because the city council has been taken over by basically a hereditary, it's become a hereditary position where elections are typically uncontested, people don't run against each other, power is held by people who've been on there for 15, 20, 30 years. And so there's a lot of resistance to even the idea that I would run against a candidate. That's, that's, that's the real breakthroughs. People are like, what? An actual election in our town? <laughs> um, so some people love it, and honestly, some people absolutely hate it. But, but it's so tremendously increased the voter engagement in our town, I don't think politics will ever be the same here again. Who are you running against? <laughs> I'm running against a, 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 a guy named Bill Dillard. He's, uh, his dad was mayor for 20 years. He's been on city council for 15 years. Um, he's proud of the fact that he has no ideas for how to improve Nehalem. He just is running on name recognition alone. He's done no campaigning whatsoever. So the mayor's seat is open at the moment? It's, uh, he's, he was an appointed mayor. It's very complicated, but basically he was appointed mayor, yeah. Okay, so he's in, in essence, he's the incumbent then. You're running against the incumbent. I am running against an incumbent. It makes people very upset. <laughs> okay, well, let's point this out. You've got a PhD, and the current mayor has finished one year of college. Nothing wrong with that. But have you found it odd to be the so-called education educated cosmopolitan globalist in the race? <laughs> you know, that has been one of the tough things is that I have a PhD and he has one year of community college education. So I come in there and I'm making the election about my platform is responsive government. We need to create, I've had five community meetings where we have people come together and they, and they try to decide what the city council should be doing. That's the basic platform is that if I'm elected mayor, I'll have these community meetings and the people will come together and decide what I should be doing as mayor, what city council we should be doing as mayor. So my campaign is all about ideas, but he can't play at that level. So his campaign has become very um, aggressive and malicious and bullying so but you know i think that some people really understand the ideas thing they understand that they want greater power and control over city council they understand that city council hasn't done it's the same as american politics the city council hasn't actually done anything in decades of just like we see the federal government in a kind of stalemate so it, it is a tricky thing, you know. Nehalem is changing, and I represent part of that change. But my promise is that I'm going to kind of help people keep Nehalem the same. Well, you know, the very funny writer Oscar Wilde once said, the problem with socialism is that it takes too many evenings. And I wonder whether it's a tough sell to get people to vote for you when what you're promising, rather than the previous guys who had the job, where they basically said, leave it to us, we'll take care of the decisions and we'll do everything, you're sort of promising to get them more engaged. And not everybody's up for that. How do you handle that? It's tough, absolutely, it's absolutely tough. I mean, if you look at it, so in the January of this year, city council meetings were typically attended by zero to maybe one or two community mem members would show up, right, literally. Um, and so I started to have these community meetings. And a lot of people told me, you know, no one's gonna be interested in all this kind of stuff. 
But in the in the three months that I held community meetings, 90 different people showed up. And in the nine months that they've had city council meetings, 40 people have shown up. So you see that there's a tremendous, actually a tremendous interest because people come to my community meetings and they say, they say their ideas and all of a sudden people get excited about those ideas and then those ideas are taken to city council and city council is forced to discuss those ideas. So I think that, that you're right. Um, there is a tremendous kind of complacency. People have been very complacent in small town politics, just touching, just trusting the hereditary government. But I think once they taste the fact that they can be given more power, um, they like it. You know, they leave my community meetings, they, they, they enjoy it. They might not agree with what I'm saying, but they like the idea that I'm giving them more power. And I think that that's the solution. We should point out that in case anybody tuned in late, 90 people doesn't sound like a lot for a community meeting, but that's almost half the population of your town. So that, in essence, is a huge crowd, yes? Right, and not all of them, because of the way that our ridiculous town is, not all of them can vote. You have to be within city limits to vote. But I would say something ab absurd, like 10 to 20 percent of all voters have been to at least one meeting, which if you imagine a city like Toronto, to say that 10 percent of Toronto voters had showed up to a town hall meeting, um, you'd be quite blown away. That's a quarter of a million people. We would be quite blown away. Uh, <laughs> tell me this, Micah. You're an African-American in a town that is almost all white. How much of a factor do you think that's going to be on Election Day? It's tough, you know. I think that the I think the biggest factor, of course, is that um, I haven't. I've only lived here four years. People pride themselves on the fact that they've lived here for forty years or generations. Of course, the weird thing about Oregon is that Oregon actually had laws that excluded black people from living in the state. <laughs> so, um, so it's a very white state. Of course, those laws were repealed, but it's a very white state. Um, and so part of, it's, part of it's my race, obviously. I think that if I were a white candidate with the same qualifications, there would be a lot more acceptance. Part of it's my age. I'm young. I'm only 34. And part of it's that I've only been here four years. Um, but, you know, I think that in the end, it's, again, it's, I'm symptomatic of a change that's already happening, which is that the Internet allows people to live in rural areas, and it allows them to get involved in local politics. So there's going to be another Michael White. He might be white, or he might be a she might be a woman, or or Asian or whatever, there's going to be more of us who are starting to move into these rural communities. And one of us, if, if not me, is going to figure out how to hack and win elections in these rural communities because we need to gain sovereignty. We need to gain control of, of, of cities. And it's much easier to imagine gaining control of Nehalem, Oregon, than it is Portland, Oregon, or Toronto, uh, even, though I, even though I'm up against tremendous adversity here. Hmm. Basically, I get the sense that if I were white, maybe people would be a little bit more accepting. It's a kind of unconscious bias against the, you know, against against me. But I think it's inst I think it's surmountable. I, I actually think people come to the community meetings and they're just taken away. They're like, this is fascinating. They finally feel engaged. I think people find just like with Occupy when they went into the assemblies, they loved it. I think the same thing can happen when they go to these community meetings. They end up being like, wow, that was that was something different. Like I want more of that. You know. What have you enjoyed about being a politician? <laughs> You know what I've loved? What I love the most about being a politician is it's like uh, a kind of, um, well, Clausewitz called politics a form of warfare. And I think what I enjoy about it, and I think the same thing that Trump enjoys actually, is that you can you can fight as hard as you want. You know, you can be honest about you know what politics, what you want to do. You can be honest about your opposition. You can be honest about the situation. I enjoy that a lot. I think that in our typical lives, we have to be so, um, you know. This, you know, we lie a lot. I think people lie a lot. And, I, and I've actually told people I'm not, I'm an activist, not a politician, you know, so I'm not here to kind of smack hands, shake hands and tell people things that they want to hear. I'm here to actually like shake things up. And I think that's, I love it. It's exciting. Hmm. You are, of course, uh, very active on social media. And in one of your recent tweets, you have called on your followers to join Anonymous's Million Mask March. Uh, for, first of all, just tell us briefly, what is that? Well, there's this amazing holiday by Anonymous called the Million Mask March, right? Which which always happens shortly before it's it's on you know Guy Fawkes Day, but mm -hmm. it's it's a worldwide event and it happens t t traditionally shortly before the U.S. election. And so I always imagine that there could be some sort of sudden social protest on Million Mask March Day this year. It's going to be November 5th, which is 72 hours before the election that somehow spills into something completely unexpected, even more unexpected than the recent FBI announcement, where people start maybe occupying the polling places and, and occupying the ballot where people are going to start voting, and, and that it has a tremendous effect swinging the election. But I do think the most important thing here is that, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to disrupt an election or to topple a, a government, but what's so much more difficult is to imagine a social movement that can run a government and govern it successfully. 
So it has to be a one-two kind of strategy. You'd have to combine the Million Mask March with a social movement that was ready to take power. But the trouble is there's no champion for all of that outrage. So what do you do with it? Yeah, that's why it's, it goes back to this question of the missed opportunity. I think that we as American activists should be kicking ourselves. We should be blaming ourselves. We should be extremely angry at all of the activists, uh, progressive activists who pushed us into supporting Bernie Sanders. I think that if we had a pirate party in this country or a five-star movement in this country or a Podemos in this country or a Syriza in this country or any of these European social movements that are winning elections in this country right now, we would be dancing in the streets. We would be saying, holy Jesus, we have one candidate who's a sexual assaulter and one candidate who's going to jail. This social movement can win and we would be surging in the polls. But of course, that's not what's happening. So I think it, it just makes me furious. It makes me so upset. Um, but you know what? If we can learn from this opportunity, there's another election in four years and we can build the infrastructure. But it's, it's tremendously sad what I'm, what I'm seeing. Micah, it sounds to me like you found your next mission. Yes? This is my life mission. Yeah, I think after Occupy, I realized what we need to do is we need to increase social movements that can win elections in not just one country, but multiple countries. A pirate party that can win elections in multiple countries or a Podemos in multiple countries. It's the most difficult task, but if we can solve that, it's going to so fundamentally improve everyone's life and that it's, it's, it's the holy grail. It's what I'm working on. And that's why it starts in Nehalem in this tiny, tiny, <laughs> tiny, tiny town. We wish you well on Election Day in Nehalem and uh, with your broader mission. Thanks so much for coming on to TVO tonight and talking about it. Thank you, Steve. It was wonderful. That's Micah White, co-creator of the Occupy Movement and the author of End of Protest. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.